Gosh, it is great to see so many of you this afternoon. It's really nice outside, and you decided to come in here. Uh, it's just wonderful to see you all. My name is Diana Murphy. I'm the Associate Director of the Language Institute in Letters and Science. Uh, the Language Institute promotes collaboration for research, education, and outreach in world languages, literatures, and cultures. We're an initiative of the College of Letters and Science with substantial support from the Division of International Studies. I'm very pleased to welcome you all to this evening's panel discussion on professional opportunities in national security and intelligence. We're very fortunate this evening, this afternoon, to welcome panelists from the DIA, the FBI, the NLSC, the NSA, and the ODNI. <laughs> Got it? <laughs> Did I get that right? So you'll learn uh, uh, this afternoon what all those acronyms uh, mean, I think. So this panel is part of a series organized by the Language Institute to help to co connect current undergraduate students to working professionals who are using a language they studied in college in their professional lives in, uh, in some kind of inspiring way. Our guest today will be talking perhaps a little less about their own experiences and about opportunities that are available uh, in national security and intelligence for, uh, for you. Uh, this event is co-sponsored by uh, a national professional organization called the National Council of, uh, of Less Commonly Taught Languages, sorry, the acronym is Nickel Tickle, for another acronym, which is holding its annual meeting in Madison this, uh, this weekend. And the event's also co-sponsored by the Russian Flagship Center on the UW-Madison campus which is an undergraduate program for highly motivated students of any major to reach a professional level of competence in Russian by graduation. The Russian flagship is supported by a grant to the UW from the language flagship of the National Security Education Program in the US Department of Defense. You all saw our brochure for the flagship when you walked in. The National Security Education Program also funds the Boren Scholarship, and you saw uh, this flyer when you walked in, uh, for undergraduate students to study abroad in world regions critical to U.S. interests. So information about the Russian Flagship Center and the Boren Scholarship Program is available on your way out if you didn't pick up those materials on your way in. So I'm now pleased to turn over the floor to my colleague Michael Cruz, who will introduce our invited guests. Michael is International Directions Advisor in the Language Institute. He provides academic and career advising to students interested in languages and international area studies, and he would love to meet with all of you. His card uh, is on the table here, so you can snag that as well. Great. Thanks, Michael. Thank you, Diana, and thank you all for coming. Um, I'm very excited to introduce our panelists. Just a quick word about the format. Um, each of our panelists are going to come up one by one and speak for about 10 minutes about the opportunities in their various agencies. Um, and then we should have a good amount of time at the end for questions and answers. The, we did have pizza, but it was a little late, so we're going to save that to the end. But so can you smell it? So it's, a, it's an incentive. It's another incentive for staying the whole time. Not that anyone would leave with our distinguished guest speaking. Um, so I'm, I'm very excited to introduce first um, Errol Smith, who is Director of Foreign Language Operations in the Office of the Director of National Intelligence. Um, he came from the Army staff, and he served at the Pentagon for seven years. He is a Turkish linguist by trade, um, by training, and he developed a critical native heritage program during the Iraq War. Um, he holds a master's degree in strategic intelligence with a concentration in counterterrorism. So please join me in welcoming Errol Smith. Everybody see that okay? Good evening. Hopefully I can be heard in the back. Yeah. Uh, if, if you can't hear me, uh, just raise your hand and I'll try to project my voice a little bit more. Uh, evening, everyone. Thank you very much for coming, and uh, more importantly, thank you very much for the invitation to be here. Uh, my name is Errol Smith. I am with the Office of the Director of National Intelligence. Um, overall, I would like to give you a little bit of background, because not everybody knows what the Director of National Intelligence is. It is a fairly new organization, uh, part of the intelligence community. 
Um, and then we'll go through the panel. Uh, you'll, you'll get more of an overview of the intelligence community from me, and I assume you're going to get more of a, an operational perspective from the other individuals on the panel. Um, so I'm just going to dive into this. And uh, I know we have a Q&A session later on, but if there is a burning question, feel free to, to, to stop me and, and ask your questions. OK. Um, so real quick, the Director of National Intelligence. Um, is everybody familiar with that? Shaking heads, not a whole lot. Yes and no's, OK. Um, following the attacks of uh, September 11, 2001, the 9-11 Commission put together a significant report, which many of you are probably aware of. In it, it recommended that there be a director for national intelligence to integrate and consolidate um, the intelligence that the community processes uh, and ensures that the in integration of that intelligence um, is shared appropriately and a, in a far more speedy fashion. Um, the Office of the Director of National Intelligence was created um, out of the Intelligence Reform Terrorism Prevention Act of 2004. We call it the IRTPA. As you notice, we are notorious for acronyms. Um, and since then, um, the director is the head of the intelligence community. Uh, there are 17 different agencies and elements within the intelligence community. Um, of which uh, are listed over here, as a matter of fact. Um, but let me walk through this and we can touch on that as we go. Uh, many of you are probably interested in the intelligence community and maybe one day pursuing a career in it. Well, those of you that are studying a foreign language, which is why we're here today, uh, our primary interest, or have uh, studied a regional and are gaining regional expertise, or developing skills in the culture itself. There are numerous positions in the intelligence community where such skills are highly desired or even required uh, for you to do those jobs. Keeping in mind, these, these jobs are critical to national security. Um, they are operational 24-7 around the world. Um, for language specifically, uh, we've listed a few positions over here. Some of these positions, um, language is required, such as the interpreters and translators. Um, and, and in other positions, language is really desired. It would really help enable your job if you were an analyst and you spoke a, a, a critical foreign language. Um, so there's some examples over there. Um, as we go through and you hear more of the operational standpoint, you'll probably hear a bit more um, specifics to each one of the, uh, the positions where language is actually required. But the intelligence community, like I said, consists of 17 different agencies and components. Um, each has a specific tradecraft, so to speak, uh, of intelligence ga gathering, analysis, and, and dissemination to uh, our leadership within the United States government and our, uh, our diplomats and our foreign policy leaders. Um, there's the list. Um, I, I will quickly go through them. The Office of the Director of National Intelligence, the Central Intelligence Agency, the Defense Intelligence Agency, the Federal Bureau of Investigation, the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency, the National Reconnaissance Office, thank you, the <laughs> National Security Agency, the Drug Enforcement Agency. And then once we get over here, we start breaking down to the intelligence components or offices for each one of these. Department of Energy, Department of Homeland Security, Department of State, Department of Treasury, uh, and then we get into the military services. The US Army, the Air Force, the Navy, the Marine Corps, and then the Coast Guard, each of which have an intelligence component to them. OK? Um, Pathways of developing foreign language, uh, well, really concentrating on your foreign language skills that have uh, played heavily into coming into our community. Um, as mentioned earlier, the National Security Education Program that currently sponsors the flagship at this school, um, there are numerous piece, pieces to that. It includes scholarships, the fellowship uh, opportunities. Uh, a new one over here I would like to highlight is the English for Heritage Language Speakers program. That's really focused for native and heritage speakers uh, that, you know, their first language is one of the critical languages that 
we're very interested in. Uh, it's a fellows program that we currently uh, host at uh, Georgetown University. Um, we really concentrate on introducing them to uh, how the government works, how intelligence essentially works. We give them exercises and we really concentrate on their English skills for those native and heritage speakers and bringing them to really um, tackle kind of the technological terms, uh, getting them ready. And then they give a nice big out brief on what they've learned uh, in the, in the fellows program, and there's nothing but intelligence community recruiters listening in and going and meeting them and saying, hey, you know, we'd be interested in you serving your country here. Uh, the Star Talk program is a, a new initiative that we're invested in, uh, and I'm going to go faster once I get past this slide, I assure you. Um, but that's really our attempt to tackle what has been kind of our biggest burden, and that is lack of critical languages being concentrated in our education system K through 12 or even through some of the colleges. The colleges are really, and universities are really starting to, to pick this up, but K through 12, I'm assuming almost everybody either had an option of Spanish or French. Uh, and it wasn't more of the other diverse languages that, or low density languages that we might be crit uh, really interested in. So the Star Talk program is a summer program, a na nationwide 50 state uh, program that really concentrates during the summer, focusing on those languages, doing uh, training sessions for students and teachers, K through, K through 16, I believe. Okay, we have made that slide and we're on. Okay, um, so federal government service. We're all within the federal government here and um, just a couple things that may, may interest you as to why uh, some benefits, um, th there, are, there are numerous ones. Um, there are competitive salaries uh, those of us in the language world, there is something that we call foreign language proficiency pay. If you have a foreign language proficiency in a language that is critical to us, um, they pay us. Uh, they pay us well for it, uh, to maintain it and to use it. Uh, so, and, and there are certain hiring bonuses with some of the agencies as well based on foreign language. Um, the, uh, the benefits of Health, dental, vision are are quite quite good. We have uh, pretty strong retirement plans, uh, the thrift savings plan, as you can see. I've listed them here for this is really for your reference as you pursue your careers after your education here. Um, travel opportunities. Everybody knows we operate around the world, uh, so it could be the very nice and it could be the not so nice, but and we do them all. Um, it is intelligence is a global operation. Uh, it includes embassies around the world, it includes military operations around the world. Um, we do compete for performance awards uh, annually. Um, we do have access to pretty nice fitness uh, facilities, depending on our agency. Um, and, you know, the, the community is really coming, the government as a whole is coming around with alternate work schedules, telecommuting, etc. A little harder to do in our community are part of the government, uh, generally because a lot of the material we handle is classified, so telecommuting, not so much, doesn't happen all a lot. Um, okay, I'm going to, oh, here's one that is probably of great interest to you, but that's student loan repayments. Uh, the federal government does offer that, and uh, the IC in particular certainly off offers that. Um, some of the requirements for working in the intelligence community itself. U.S. citizenship is required, and only U.S. citizenship. I don't believe dual citizenship is really considered. The only time where considerations are made is where we get into the faculty type positions, the, really the instructors of language, and et cetera. Um, we do have, uh, for those of you that are joining based on your foreign language skills, uh, you are tested um, as you come in for your proficiency and uh, your brought it, uh, measured based on the interagency language roundtable scale. Many of you, I'm sure, are familiar with. If not, we'll, and we'll tackle that during the Q&A. Um, we focus on the small density and, and global languages, uh, all of which that are critical. Um, then we go through a pretty intense background check. Um, I say intense because it's necessary. It does include fingerprinting, drug screening, medical, psychological evaluations, and depending on your level of clearance, a polygraph exam. 
uh, based on based on the actual position. Uh, most of most of the intelligence uh, positions do require a, do require all of those. Uh, I know I've been through it. I'm assuming most of uh, the folks here have too. Um, and uh, this used to be a long, painful process in the past. It still is somewhat long, but it's uh, based on the horror stories I've heard in the past. It's uh, Significantly, significantly come down uh, in time. Based on different backgrounds, et cetera, it may take longer, but it's really uh, moving fast. We are given a conditional offer of employment until we pass all this, and all that is checked. So this is just a reference for your uh, pursuit of uh, future employment with the IC, which brings me to this uh, website. The intelligence.gov website is on the open internet. I highly recommend that all any of you interested in working for the intelligence community, any one of the agencies, I would start here before you even go into one of the agency websites, because from here you can actually access each one of the 17 different agencies and elements. It gives you a very good overview of what the intelligence community is, what it means to process intelligence, and, it, and then it can link you to the Director of National Intelligence Portal, gives you good references, gives you history on the laws, re statutes, regulations that established us. And then uh, it has great um, links to all the, all the 17 components, like I said, but one I want to highlight at the bottom here is the annual IC Virtual Career Fair. This has been a uh, Three years now, I believe. Uh, we just finished one. Uh, it's a it's a virtual way of having a career fair where recruiters um, really talk and focus on individuals that access it based on their language skills or the sci scientific technological skills. Uh, those are the, really the two concentrations that are focused on, on this. But uh, that's a heavy. Um, it's a very strong method of our recruiters uh, working with on their national recruiting effort. So that's the intelligence.gov. Uh, I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on this one because uh, I haven't found it. Well, I mean, it is useful. You can certainly access different things about the federal government itself um, and information. But this is the Bureau of Labor Statistics. Um, the link is here. I'm hoping the slides will be available to you following this. So. But I'm going to move to this one, which is USA Jobs. On the intelligence.gov, you'll find all jobs listed uh, within the IC, the intelligence community. Over here, you'll find all jobs listed that are intelligence plus the rest of the federal government. So it's a, it's a very large catalog, so to speak, but it's, uh, it's, a, it's a great resource. This is essentially our way of coming into the government, applying for a job, finding a specific <coughs> occupation. And, and going through there. But um, again, I would start at the intelligence.gov. I would use this probably as a second one during your, your search. Um, I've, we've listed a lot of uh, different helpful links for you to do kind of some homework uh, as you uh, pursue your, your, your careers here. But a lot of them um, are really focused on just kind of like federal benefits, et cetera. And then this one right here is um, something I'd really like to you, you all to focus on, but it, it includes some of the websites that I talked about. But then it gives some very good um, websites for maintaining and, and building your language, regional expertise, and cultural skills. Defense Language Institute, uh, .edu, DLIFLC.edu is an excellent and free resource to you. Uh, the National Language Service Corps, which you're going to hear about a little bit later, um, and, and all the other programs that I talked about, StarTalk, EHLS, uh, they're all here. So I've given you the links. Feel free to take a look at it. Uh, I'm going to end real quick over here, but um, I'm going to end with our leadership to include the White House, members of Congress, and certainly the ODNI have always put foreign language skills high on their priorities as far as increasing that capability. Um, we, there certainly, we have numerous resources for maintaining and building those skills, uh, whether it, it includes recruiting, training, education, or technologies. And before I close here, I think I've utilized my time pretty well. Um, 
the technology has certainly come a long way and we utilize it well. We don't have the, what we like to call the Star Trek interpret, interpreter device in our hand that's going to do the simultaneous interpretation, but um, technology is used significantly in our community. And it takes individuals with those language skills to feed that technology to make it better. Um, and really the technology is not there to replace the human, it's there to enable them. Uh, it's there to support the linguist, support the analyst, etc. So uh, be aware in today's day and age, all of you probably have iPads, etc., etc. Um, we're, we are headed that way and we're fully engaged with it and um, please be aware of it. So um, that's it from me as far as an overview of languages. Do you have a list of these? Um, not openly. I don't believe there is a list. But I could tell you that... Um, you give me the top three. <laughs> I, would t I would take the global languages of the world. Uh, when I say global, the, l large, the high density languages that cover a large span of the region. And secondly, I would go into, I would follow military operations as to where they are involved currently, and I would pick those. So you'd look at Afghanistan being a different case, not so much a large density language such as Arabic, or that covers numerous uh, countries and regions, but um, for Af Afghanistan has been a, a particular case of low density languages that are important to us. How about Russian? Russian certainly is, of course. Sure. Any other burning questions? And well, I, uh, I guess we'll save it for the Q&A session. But think about your questions. Uh, any questions about coming into the community itself, uh, the kind of work we do. Next, I would ask Peter Sourcey to come up. Peter Sourcey is the unit chief of the Language Personnel Resources Unit for the Federal Bureau of Investigation, which manages the national hiring process for linguists. He began his career with the FBI in 1997 as a Japanese linguist before moving into management. Um, thank you. Okay, so uh, I'm actually going to echo a lot of the same themes that uh, both Errol and Patrice have mentioned, and we're going to talk really quickly about the kind of jobs at the FBI. I'm not gonna talk about what the FBI does. You've all seen TV. I, we, can, we can skip that. And it's exactly like that. Um, though I have never personally been on the hunt for a serial killer, um, I still hope that someday I will manage to do that. Um, what I'm gonna tell you is that being bad is a growth industry. And um, people are bad not in English all the time. And so if you can't get it, you know, a job at the FBI right now, um, shockingly enough, people will still be bad um, five years from now or 10 years from now uh, or 20 years from now so you don't really have to worry about that. Um, so put yourself in the category, are you a, I'm definitely a language person, hardcore, I have really, really solid language skills. If so, then really what you are looking at is a language analyst position. And that's uh, the same position that uh, Patrice talked about, the NSA. Um, the FBI is a little bit uh, different because we have the um, criminal uh, part of our mission. Um, the standard law enforcement, you know, breaking in doors, catching the bad guys, um, again, like you've seen on TV. Um, but also the intelligence um, part that Patrice mentioned. So our language analysts are really um, doing all of that work at the same time. And as a language analyst, you may work on a criminal case one day, and you may be working on a counterintelligence case the next day. And two weeks from now, you may be interviewing a victim of a crime. Um, in coordination with case agents and analysts. So uh, what you're getting is sort of the buffet option, um, but it's all in Spanish or it's all in Pashto or it's all in Urdu because that's your specialty. If you have some language skill, but maybe it's not you know, to that same degree, and we'll talk about that in a little bit, um, then really you're looking at a job, uh, as Errol mentioned, where your language capability is really gonna enhance your ability to do that other job. And for that, I would point you at the special agent position or the intelligence analyst position. Um, so the special agent of the FBI, I'm again, again, this is a type A person that wants to catch bad guys. That's what they do, right? Um, and if you think about it, what are they gonna be doing with foreign language? They're gonna be interviewing victims, interviewing witnesses, developing sources. So what they're really doing is they're forming relationships using that language skill, okay? So um, really, you know, you wanna, those type of people, they're extroverts, they're, you know, really good with people. That's the kind of person that makes a great 
special agent. An intelligence analyst, on the other hand, um, is a slightly different job. What they're really doing is they're um, working either on a tactical level with one particular case, or they're looking at a strategic um, standpoint, either some topic or some area of the world. And what they're trying to do is they're trying to take 10,000 pieces of data and figure out what the heck is going on in it. Um, and what they're doing is they're using their language skill to get closer to primary sources of, infor of information. And that's really what that language skill is good for. So it's more research in the foreign language. You don't have to depend on a translator to tell you what that website says because you can read that website yourself in Chinese or Urdu or Arabic. Okay, so um, at the FBI, all these jobs work in, co in coordination with one another, so it, it, they're really sort of members of the same team. They don't, um, they don't compete with one another, they're doing different uh, things. So you sort of have to decide, are you more of a take charge, kick down the door, catch the bad guys kind of person, which belief to you if you are, um, are you not really that? Are you more of a, I'm really trying to connect the dots, I'm really trying to um, figure out, uh, I have 10,000 puzzle pieces, is the puzzle kittens playing with a ball of yarn? I don't know. Is it a forest in Vermont? You don't know what the picture is. All you know is you have 10,000 pieces and you're trying to put together and figure out what the picture is all at the same time in Chinese. Um, so no pressure. Uh, so that's really what the intelligence analyst job is all about. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna then g now give you my top 10 insider tips um, for applying to a job at the FBI. So this is pure gold. Um, so get your pens out. Um, the first thing is you have to know the requirements now um, as you're starting to think about what you want to do. And this again echoes something that Patrice and Errol um, said. Every agency has its own requirements um, th and they're different. So you really have to look at each agency that you might be considering individually because some of them are the same. U.S. citizenship, everybody's got that requirement. But um, let's talk about the language skill. We both referenced the ILR, the Interagency Language Roundtable. Um, all government agencies that use linguists use that uh, skill level description set as our baseline. Um, and the ILR is a government consortium. They've developed uh, descriptive modalities um, for professional level in listening, reading, translation, audio translation, interpreting, cultural competency. So that's what we use. So if we say he listens um, at a three in Chinese, then we all know what that means. That, because it means the same thing to all of us. Um, so you really have to know, are there physical requirements for the job? Like special agents have certain physical requirements. You have to go to run, do all these other things. Um, are there um, uh, you know, entry, uh, requirements to be in country for a certain amount of time to get a security clearance? That may differ. Um, and even what language levels we require differs. So as Patrice mentioned, at her agency, um, they do the listening and reading test. At the FBI, you have to take a listening test, a reading test, a translation test from English, uh, from foreign language into English, a speaking test in English, and a speaking test in the foreign language. So you have to take all uh, five tests. It's quite an extensive test battery. Um, so know your requirements. Number two, um, be interesting, but not too interesting. Um, so this is always the, how much, of, how much life experience do you bring to the table that makes you great versus makes you a risk? Okay, that, and it's, it's a balance, okay? So international travel, that brings a lot to the table, right? As we talked about, you know, you know cultures in a way that studying them, you know, here in the classroom, it's never gonna bring you. The longer you're overseas, then the more questions are, what are your loyalties? How many foreign connections do you have? Does that make you riskier? And does that make you more um, able to be coerced? Right? Let's just put it out there. Drug policy. You got to know it because you have to be clean for a certain number of years. If you need to start the clock now, you need to know that. Okay? So that's what I mean by interesting but not too interesting. I'm just going to put it out there. We all think it. Um, number three, um, consider an oblique attack. So if you think that you want to be a special agent or you want to be an intelligence analyst, those jobs are highly competitive. It's actually much easier at the FBI to get those jobs from inside the agency. And I'll bet you that in some of the other agencies the same. So what you may want to do is consider taking a different entry level position and working as um, a management analyst or a surveillance specialist or a budget or an HR specialist inside the organization for, for a couple of years first. And then um, apply to the agent job or the analyst job 
from within the organization. So you may, that's just may be something you want to think about. Uh, number four, be willing to go someplace nobody else wants to go. So um, it's actually very difficult to staff positions in New York, in Washington, D.C., in Detroit, and a couple other offices. So if you're willing to go there, suddenly you're way more competitive than, well, I really want to stay in Dallas, but only on Thursdays because it was really nice. So, you know, you have got to be willing to go where nobody else wants to go. Uh, number five, okay, so I would set up uh, job alerts either with Google Alerts or at USA Jobs. Most of these uh, websites have um, little tickler systems or things where you can set, have it send alerts to yourself. This combination of job title plus this city plus this posting date, whatever, um, send it to my personal email. I would go to all the sites and set up um, ticklers for yourself and have them send you uh, alerts as positions become available. Um, number six, uh, we all talked about uh, the intelligence.gov site, the FBI, uh, USA Jobs. Um, so fbijobs.gov has two um, subsites for you that would be very interesting. Uh, there's fbijobs.gov slash linguists. That talks about our language analyst uh, positions and our contract linguist positions. For the language analysts, let's go back to the hardcore uh, language people. What, you're re what we're really looking at is starting you off as a part-time, effectively, a freelance translator who we clear and give you a top secret clearance. You work for us on an hourly basis. And then of those people, we pick the best to become employee linguists. Okay, it's not for everybody, so starting uh, off as a contract linguist is sort of a good way, do you like us, do we like you, is your work good, is the work for you, is it a good fit? Um, so you'll find all the information about the contract linguist position at the slash linguist site. Also, fbijobs.gov slash college uh, talks about their uh, university hiring program. So the university hiring program is a way that the um, FBI sets a schedule, they usually set it in the summer to begin in late summer, early fall. They travel to campuses around the country. Um, if they don't go to your campus, then they have like an open application online. Um, and this is in September and October, where they're looking to grab university people who want those entry level positions like I talked about, not the special agent, not maybe the intelligence analyst position, but really some of those other positions because they can direct hire you out of college into those positions very easily. From an HR perspective, it's much much easier to hire you direct out of school than it is to hire you once you're you know, more complicated later. Um, so uh, I would look at the Slash College site. They haven't set up their um, visits for next year yet, but um, they will be doing a major overhaul of that website this summer, so I would look at that. Uh, number seven, uh, if I want to get a job when I graduate, when do I need to be applying? Um, as Patrice mentioned, in September, uh, before you graduate because it will take that long to get you through uh, the process and the background investigation. Uh, number eight, uh, do not look up on the internet how to beat a polygraph. Because if you take a polygraph, they will ask you, have you ever looked up on the internet how to beat a polygraph? And if you say yes, you're done. You're out. Because they consider that your attempt to try to beat the polygraph. And the FBI does not like people who are trying to beat the polygraph because they see that as deceitful. So don't do that. So I'm just, that's an insider tip from me to you, don't do that. Um, important to know. Um, number nine, be careful about your social media profiles. It's becoming a much bigger deal for us now. Um, we are absolutely checking the social media profiles and it's less about, do you have pictures of yourself drinking on your social media profile? Okay, that's maybe ridiculous and silly of you, um, but it's much more along the lines of who are you connected to? How many foreign contacts do you have? Are you susceptible to coercion? Do you know bad people or are you Facebook friends with bad people? Because that is a problem for the FBI if you're Facebook friends with bad people. So be watchful, be careful of that. Um, and then finally, uh, number 10, each agency has its own flavor and character. We are not really in competition with one another at all. Even though we're all talking about language jobs, we're all talking about language analysts and this and that, the reality is there is a place for you somewhere and it might not be at the FBI. It might be at NSA, or it might not be at NSA, it might be at DIA, or it might be somewhere else. So you really need to look at what those agencies do and think about what kind of person wants to do that. And is that the right job for you? Um, it's very hard as a manager to have a great employee who's in the wrong job. Like, you're a great employee, this is, this is not the right place for you, because then you're talking about quitting. That, and that's not, a, that's not a place we want to put any, a position we want to put anybody in. So um, really take the time, 
talk to people. Um, they're almost always alumni networks, events like this where we're out talking to people, um, make some connections, really be thoughtful about it. Those are my top 10 tips for you. And I'll be happy to take questions later. Okay? <laughs>
are crawling under barbed wire fences. But obviously, there are some information that we can't get from imagery, that we cannot get from signals intelligence, or it, it clues us into some other things we'd like to know. So we do have people that are field. They go out to the field, think of them as like a detective or a reporter or something like that. They have to go out and try to collect some information and report it back to those all-source analysts. Now we're talking about people that really better have some language skills, because that all-source analyst who's back there looking at all sorts of products that have done, been done in English, you know, all sorts of reporting that's done in English, it would be nice if they could go back and validate that, maybe take a look if, you know, country X produces a new national defense policy, say if that report actually reflects what's out there. But when you're doing the collection side, you have to be able to speak, you have to be able to listen and understand, Okay, you have to be able to read things. Okay, that we're looking for a very high level of proficiency. Our goal there is to get folks up to at least that ILR level three. If you've taken language courses and you're wondering, I wonder what my language might be in the ILR, where might, might I be, might fit in that? If you go to that Interagency Language Roundtable website that we've been talking about, there is actually uh, three documents that you can uh, click on, it's a PDF, and there can do statements. Speaking, can you do this, yes or no? Can you do that, yes or no? And you go down the list and it gives you an idea of if you're at the level one, the level two, the level three, the level four. Okay, so I would recommend as you do your homework, as Peter's talking about, go out there and take a look, because I get folks that with resumes that say, I speak high proficiency, you know, Korean. The other one says, well, I speak super duper Korean. Well, I speak, you know, like, okay, well, I don't know what all this means. You've taken the classes. I'm not gonna do a transcript analysis. We're actually gonna give you a test the DLPT, the same one that NSA uses, Department of Defense uses it for listening comprehension, reading comprehension, and we also test you in speaking, okay? Because we want to have that total awareness of what all of your capabilities are so that when we need to, I can reach out into the workforce and find that one individual. We have a, an exchange going on with another country next week, won't tell you the country, but I get uh, a call on Thursday saying, hey, I need a list of all the people that speak X language at level three or better to help facilitate this exchange, to be there to converse, you know, just to, you know, just to be there at the event. Not that they're gonna have to translate anything, not that they're gonna have to interpret for the group, but just to be there to facilitate during that, that liaison activity, that exchange activity. Okay, so it's an enabling skill, it's not a requirement, but we are, uh, we are hiring very aggressively in the, in, in the, the normal suspect languages. Okay, even things like Spanish. We do pay foreign language proficiency pay. So depending on your proficiency and the total number of languages that you qualify in, we can get up to $13,000 a year. Uh, don't know about you, but that's a pretty nice chunk of change. It's like a little part-time job on the side. You keep your proficiency up and you get, the, you know, get a little bit something on the side. But that tells me who speaks what language, what proficiency, so I can go out and find you if I need you for some reason. Uh, we do have internships. If you go to our di.mil website, it's pretty much the same cycle. We're gonna advertise those things. Uh, it's summer internships, so there's like 12 weeks in the summer. We're gonna advertise that somewhere around August or September. The closing date is around October. You have to have about 60 credit hours, you know, so we're looking at folks that are like going to be juniors uh, or beyond that uh, for those types of jobs. And DIA, although we are headquartered in Washington, D.C., we have positions at all of the combatant commands so we are in Hawaii, we are in Germany, we are in Tampa, we are in Miami, we are at, you know, Omaha, Nebraska, you know, wherever there's a combatant command, we are there. So we have positions at all those places, okay? So we are global. And also, if you are uh, working as an analyst, for example, at DIA, there are opportunities for you to go out to one of our defense attache offices that are at embassies worldwide. We have about 140 of them, okay? So that's another opportunity. And I'll tell you what, having been a defense attache, if I get a request saying, okay, Mary, Mary Jo analyst wants to come down here to my defense attache office, one of the first things I say is, what are, what are Mary Jo's language skills? Because I need someone that's gonna come on board and help us not become an administrative burden. Okay, because a lot of times I would get an analyst, very weak language skills, they can't really help do the job that they're coming down to do if they don't have those language skills plus they become a burden on me and my staff because we have to call the landlord, we have to call the hotel, you know, it's like, you know, learn the language because it's really that important. Um, the USA job agent, all this has been covered, you know, Peter, Peter had 10, I, I probably had like four. But there were awesome four. I'm telling, well, there were awesome four, 
Uh, you know, so, you know, you really kind of took the, uh, I learned something. I, I might have gotten a better job if I had heard your tips. I was thinking we should talk to you. So, um, I'll be, answer, I'll be glad to answer questions for the sake of time during the Q&A, and I will stay behind after if anyone wants a one-on-one -on -one discussion. But please pick up a brochure, look at our video, and um, if you think you got what we are looking for, please contact us and uh, take a look at our vacancies that are out there. Thank you. And um, last but not least, we have William Rivers, who is the Chief Linguist at the National Language Service Corps. Dr. Rivers has overall responsibility for advising the Director on language and culture in all facets of the NLSC. This includes membership standards, proficiency standards, and certification, NLSC relations with heritage, academic, and government language communities, and language and culture training for NLSC members. Okay, I'm, I'm Bill Rivers, as, as Michael said. I'm, uh, my PhD is in Russian. Are there Russian students in the audience? Flagship students? All right, great. Russian is a critical language, always has been, always will be. Um, <laughs> wonderful language. And I also have, a, I have probably now level two-ish proficiency in French. I used to have much better French, but I don't use it often enough. Um, the National Language Service Corps is, is a little bit different, okay? than these other guys. These agencies provide full-time employment uh, looking for people to come and make careers. We are something a little bit new. Um, the National Language Service Corps was, is a new network of American citizens who speak foreign languages who can help any government agency in time of need, okay? Um, we, we work for all government agencies, all federal government agencies, and we complement existing language programs, such as the ones that, uh, that Peter and, and Al manage uh, and in, in their agencies. We are administered by the Defense Language and National Security Education Office. Uh, the, I think Sam, I think you're one of the deputy directors of that office, uh, formerly, the, formerly known as NSCP. And they do a lot of different things in language. If you've got a flagship, uh, fellowship, if you're in a flagship program, if you're a born scholar or fellow, you're also getting support from them. Um, one of the things you take away from these, these, these talks tonight, uh, it's not just that people will be bad all the time or that the U.S. has interests all over the world, it's that there's 6,400 languages out there. Um, nobody speaks all of them. A great number of them are spoken in the United States. We have interests everywhere in the world. Globalization doesn't happen without languages, and so on and so forth. So there, there's no government agency that will ever have all of the people it, it needs who speak foreign languages, either because there just aren't enough of them, or because, hey, all of a sudden we need Maldivian. You know, the, uh, the, prime, the prime minister of the Maldives was deposed about two months ago. Or we need uh, Zapotec or Mishtec, or now we need Nuristani, or other languages that we, we didn't anticipate. What we do is we maintain, identify and maintain basically a list of members who have language skills um, who are available when needed and we provide a surge capacity. We started in really as a, an idea that uh, a colleague of mine, Richard Brecht, testified before Congress in 2002, said, hey, there are a lot of people out there uh, who are heritage speakers, who are uh, immigrants themselves, or who are um, people like yours truly, who, who acquired their language uh, through academic means, um, who aren't necessarily going to work full-time for the government or aren't necessarily going to go to work full-time in the language industry, but who would be available uh, to help out when they're needed, much like people go to, you know, when the, when the volunteer fire department siren rings and people go jump on the truck. Um, there's, so this slide gives a history, but basically we started planning in about 2007 uh, after some feasibility studies, started recruiting in 2008. We did our first assignment in 2009 in Atlanta, Georgia for the Centers for Disease Control. And as of December, it's actually right now, it's April, we have more than 3,300 members in 240 languages, and we've done actually 31 missions for different U.S. government agencies. So what have we done? Um, this is, there's a lot of very small text on this slide. 
I've done a lot of uh, a lot of missions. I just want to highlight some of the things we're, we've worked for. I think most of you guys, at some point or another, we've provided people to NSA, we've provided people to DIA, but also, as I said, the Centers for Disease Control. Um, we're meeting on Monday with the U.S. Forest Service. Uh, we'll be meeting uh, later in May with the Social Security Administration. Uh, there are lots of government agencies that have requirements for language. Uh, the, the FBI, Interpol, Washington. Um, Interpol is an international police organization, and uh, I'm not quite sure what they do, but, uh, but we're helping them. Tran translate documents. Um, we've worked for a good number of different military commands and agencies over the last three years. Um, we specialize, we're kind of the last people to get called. Um, when an agency cannot find a linguist or a, an employee or a service member uh, within their, their ranks, we often get the call saying, uh, hi Bill, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's Joe from Germany. Remember, we thought we might need a, uh, an Arabic speaker, a Hassaniya Arabic speaker. Yeah, yeah, you called me about two weeks ago. Yeah, yeah, we need him. Yeah, it's Thursday, and can you get him to, uh, to, uh, to Munich on Monday? Okay. It's Tuesday, okay. You know, and that actually did happen, and we sent someone to Germany for 63 days. Um, we have worked very hard to improve the capacity for testing. Because as, as uh, my colleagues have alluded to, there are government tests, the oral proficiency interview, the defense language proficiency test, the ILR scale, which goes from zero to five, so that's six points. Um, three, which is the midpoint of the scale, is considered professional knowledge. Your, your ability in the language is, you can, you can go practice a profession in the language. Um, but if you have 240 languages, there aren't tests in all those languages. So we're working very hard on increasing ways of uh, testing people. And we are looking at a uh, permanent where pilot program have been since 2007. Um, and we are told that our legislation will go through in 2013. It's probably right on the top of the list. They've told us that the last two or three years. The program will continue regardless. How do you become a member? Um, and what are members doing? So members have to be U.S. citizens. That's, that's in our legislation. You have to have certified language proficiency and you have to be proficient in English. Um, you're no good if you can only speak one language, you have to have two. And by speak a language, we really mean listen, read, and uh, speak in the target language and in English. We screen people initially using the same set of can-dos that Al referred to. Um, I can give directions to the nearest metro station. I can read a menu. I can serve as an informal, uh, informal interpreter at a diplomatic reception for the ambassador. And, and it's a range of graded statements that go, again, from, we actually start at one, we don't start at zero, they go from one to five. And based on how many you check off yes, we say, okay, you're probably a two plus, you're probably a three, et cetera. Based on that, we admit people to membership. We test about 10% of our members on an annual basis, uh, in part to prepare people for being selected and sent out to an agency, and in part to make sure that those can-dos actually predict some proficiency. Um, we use the defense language proficiency test for listening and reading and the oral proficiency interview for speaking. Um, and we pay for that test and, and, and arrange that for the members. Um, if, if you, we don't test everyone in English. Um, if, you are, if you're screened as a member, as, as you go through the application process, our, our telephone interviewers do a, do, a, do a fairly straightforward screening and we can recommend people take an English test if they need it. What are the members doing? So members are, they just have their regular day lives, day jobs or whatever they're doing. I'm a Russian member. I haven't been, I haven't been selected for an assignment yet, which kind of, kind of irritates me. I had to talk to the director about that. But um, I said, really, there's one coming up in Bishkek that I'd really like to go on, in Kyrgyzstan. Um, but you, you keep, you do whatever you do. And we have people, you have to be 18, of course, to join. We have people from, from 18 up into their 80s. Um, who are students, uh, who are retired, who are um, working in, in whatever profession they're working in, and until you accept an assignment. Now, all assignments are voluntary, and you can turn down an assignment without prejudice. If you, are, you don't want to take an assignment, you're not available, uh, that doesn't, we don't hold that against the members. Um, when people are activated for service and they accept an assignment, through the magic of, uh, of the uh, human resources process, we turn people into temporary federal civilian employees on an intermittent work schedule, which means you're an on-call employee and we pay 
uh, a stipend basically of $25 an hour. When we first set up the uh, National Language Service Corps, people indicated they would do this voluntarily, but we were told we couldn't actually buy tickets for people and, and give them travel insurance and so on, give them inoculations if they're going into the jungles of Thailand unless they were actually federal employees. So they're federal employees for the duration of their service. And we cover all the travel and any, any additional training that's required. Um, as far as clearances go, we don't require that members be cleared. Uh, we clear a certain percentage of the members based on the demand signals that we get from our agencies. Uh, the same things obtained for the clearances as they do for all these other guys. We typically don't clear quite as high unless an agency requests it. Uh, because of the, the peculiarities and, and uh, rules surrounding the clearance process. But again, a clearance is not a mandatory requirement to, to be an NLSC member. And I would say probably 80% of our assignments do not require clearances. We had a lot of languages. It's just a long list. Um, I, one of the things I do in my, uh, the Dr. Rivers part, my academic research, is language capacity in the U.S. Our best estimates are between 9,000 and 1,100 languages spoken in the U.S. Um, so there are a lot of languages that come into the NLSC. Uh, some of the languages are a little bigger than others because they were part of our pilot phase where we were recruiting in 10 languages, but now we're recruiting in all languages. We have active requirements in French, active requirements in Spanish, uh, Russian. So the, I, I, sooner or later we will get the German and the Italian <laughs> requirements. Um, we've had a number of requirements in Japanese. So pretty much uh, any language you come into the NLSC that you have, uh, you can expect sooner or later will be called on. A lot of languages. Um, members in every state and almost every congressional district and all over the world, wherever there are U.S. citizens. Um, we sent a, US, a member from uh, Kuala Lumpur in Malaysia to Thailand, actually, for one assignment. And another 380 applicants uh, waiting to join. They're from all walks of life. Um, we have... Uh, former Peace Corps volunteers, we have retirees, we have professors and teachers and students, we have real estate agents, engineers, retired military, and so on and so forth. Pretty much any, anything you can imagine. Because again, these are folks who wouldn't necessarily be uh, looking to get a job in the federal government, but who are um, interested in giving some of their language skills back. Um, before I, but I will say as well that that uh, one of the things that we've been asked to do by a number of agencies is can you give us a list? Can you help us recruit in specific languages? And what we'll do is we'll say, okay, let's take that back to the members. We'll ask whatever members are interested and put them in touch with the agency. So for some of our members, it has been a pathway into the, the regular federal recruiting process that these guys engage in. Um, assignments, we've done all sorts of things. Domestic emergency support, the Centers for Disease Control pandemic preparation. Uh, some of you may remember SARS or uh, you know uh, the bird flu or contagion. One of those was a movie. Um, we sent people who spoke Marshallese, uh, Russian, and Mandarin Chinese to Atlanta to help the CDC develop their websites for those communities in the US. Um, what our members did was a combination of you know, localization of the website, so translating it and so on, but a lot of it was actually more cultural Cultural, cross-cultural communications consultation. Um, in order to reach these communities, how do you construct the website? What kind of materials, what kind of images and color schemes do you need? Um, after the Gulf oil spill, uh, the Secretary of the Navy, who was responsible for uh, the reconstruction after the oil spill, uh, requested that we find Vietnamese and Spanish and a couple other languages to serve as interpreters at town hall meetings. These are very charged events, as you can imagine, in the, these fishing communities on the Gulf Coast. Um, we've done overseas military, both operational and disaster support. Uh, last fall, we had the uh, U.S. Coast Guard Cutter Forward, which was assisting West Af the, the West African Maritime, Maritime Law Enforcement uh, Project, which is West African nations. We needed a Chinese speaker to go to a Coast Guard Cutter and spend three months off of West Africa. Um, again, that, that was another one of those situations where the Coast Guard has a linguist, and it has its own linguist that has linguists in the Coast Guard, etc., but they couldn't find anyone for this assignment. So they called us, and on about six days' notice, we got one of our members to Dakar, Senegal, to join uh, the uh, Coast Guard Cutter Forward, doing all sorts of law enforcement uh, uh, assistance uh, with the Coast Guard. Um, U.S. African Command, we sent someone to Germany as a classroom interpreter. Um, national need, we uh, do a good bit of work with different languages. 
You have some of the members here. We've sent people to Indonesia uh, as part of a combination uh, training exercise with the Indonesian military and uh, humanitarian assistance projects. Um, and that includes uh, a former civil engineer, retired civil engineer, who was helping uh, teams of US military work with Indonesian military to construct latrines and uh, health clinics in remote parts of, of central Indonesia and central, uh, central uh, Java. Um, Thailand for six weeks to do training and so on. So lots of different assignments that, uh, that we do. Um, this is more on the, the, the Coast Guard uh, response. It was actually two months, not three, but, uh, but again, we sent a, a young member who's a, I believe she got her degree from Berkeley and she spent, uh, she lived on a bunk on a Coast Guard ship. Uh, Coast Guard cutter, I'm not, I didn't get that term right, that's all right. Um, current mission, we are Interpol Washington. We have an interagency agreement, that's kind of inside Beltway, um, translating criminal activity message traffic. Um, so we're translating stuff. I don't know what criminal activity message traffic is, it's, but bad guy stuff. Thank you, Peter. See, I, I, I used to work. I used to work more on the on a different part of this stuff. So I, I didn't do bad guy stuff. Um, three Spanish, one French. 130 work days, um, and they're helping police around the world, and in, engage with the uh, U.S. Department of Justice. And lots of other things, I, you know, this, all these slides will be made available, right? Um, one of the things I'd like to point out, we're sending Russian and Dari speakers to Kyrgyzstan. We are uh, sending a Vietnamese speaker uh, to Hawaii and then to Vietnam to look at PO, to help with POW, POW recovery mission. We have a whole bunch of other, uh, other requirements that are there. And, and these come up continually. And in fact, I haven't checked my uh, my, my secure email today to see what requirements we've got today, but usually we get two or three in uh, during the course of a week. Um, what, what we think the value of the NLSC is, both for the members and for the country, we're focused on service and, and the members themselves are focused on service and giving, again, giving their language skills back to the broader community. And the NLSC also works very hard to support its members. Um, we have a lot of things we do through our website. There's a member website. Um, you go to nlscorps.org, um, you can apply there, but there's a, a site for members as well that you can log in. Uh, we have access to SCOLA and Langnet, which are uh, high quality resources for, for improving your proficiency. SCOLA, some of you may have used SCOLA in your classes. Um, I think the, the faculty probably know more about it than students. But SCOLA is, on, is online streaming of broadcasts in more than 120 languages. Langnet are uh, online listening and reading materials and test preparation materials in about 40 languages. We have quarterly newsletters, local, we're organizing local chapters, and we go out and meet and greet with our, our members on a regular basis. And we really do want the feedback from our members, so, so we're still a very, very new organization in, in, in Washington, D.C. terms. We're really only about three years old in terms of how, how we, when we've been active. I've already said all this, but w what we really do is we try to try to help match um, the desire for volunteer service, and there's a little pay involved and some professional development involved, with, with the gaps that the government has in its language requirements. Um, and that's what I've got, and I'll be glad to take questions, so. Thank you, everyone. So we have a little bit of time for questions. Um, and my colleague Wendy is going to play a little Maury and run around yeah. with the mic. So um, please, yeah, go ahead. Um, this is for anybody. There seemed to be a little, I, I got a little confused between the difference between a DLPT and an ILR. I, are they interchangeable or, um, or is there a conversion? Sure, I don't need the microphone. Yeah, I don't need the microphone. So the deal is that the ILR is the... It's for the recording. Yeah. The ILR... Do I need it? Okay, I blow out the speaker, though. Um, so the ILR is the agency that sets the standard. And if you go to uh, govtilr.org, that's the website that has all the ILR standards. That's what says, if you speak at a three, what does it mean? If you listen at a three, what does that mean? That's the ILR. There are different tests that measure each modality, 
that give you an ILR score. Most of us use the DLPT, the Defense Language Proficiency Test, as the standard test for listening and reading. Okay, that's what most of us use. The OPI, the Oral Proficiency Interview, or sometimes it's called a Speaking Proficiency Test, that's the standard test for a speaking score. That's, how, that's the test name. I was just wondering about the dual citizenship requirement. Is that a, you're disqualified if you have it or you need to give it up once you get it? If, like if you had offered the job, are you disqualified for it? Or um, you you will not be offered the job, I'm assuming this is on, you will not be offered the job um, if you are a dual citizen. It is required to be solely US citizen. So at the FBI, you have to be willing to renounce your second citizenship Oh, I'm sorry. Um, you have to be willing to renounce your second citizenship, but we actually don't make you renounce it. But um, there are certain countries where, if you're if you're a dual citizen, you ha you have to you if you want to go to that country, you have to travel on that country's passport. So, for example, if you have dual citizenship with Israel, you can't go in on your U.S. passport. They just won't let you do that. So, um, you know, a lot of our linguists um, still have family there. So, if they ever want to go see mom again, um, they have to maintain their dual citizenship in order to get. There. So what we do is we actually collect um, your other country passport in our security office, and you check it out like a library book when you need it. Um, you have to report, I mean, for all of us, you have to report your foreign travel, report what you do, report who you talk to, like that's all standard anyway. Um, so it's just a part of that process. So it may uh, differ. And for the NLSC, the National Language Service Court, only if a clearance is required do the dual citizenship issues come up. And as, as, as Peter's indicated, these, the details vary from agency to agency, so you really have to get into the specifics of it. Um, so that's, but to be an NLSC member, we require US citizenship. But we don't, we don't generally care if you're a dual citizenship for the NLSC. Though it would affect whether you'd be selected for assignment to one of these guys. Hi, um, I was wondering um, about how the um, government feels about having a spouse who is not uh, a citizen. He's on the track to citizenship one day, but as of now, he's a foreign national. Okay, again, it really uh, depends on the level of clearance, and um, it also depends what nationality the spouse is um, and how that affects our security measures. Um, it's not a disqualifier necessarily, but it, it is certainly, we have numerous levels of, of clearances. I mean, you could have just a, um, I forget the lowest one, it's kind of like a, a confidential information type level clearance, then you get to a secret level clearance, and then you get to a top secret level clearance, and then you get to a top secret um, SCI, sens sensitive compartmented information. Uh, and as you go to the top ones, particularly top secret and higher, that, that's where um, you know, these kinds of uh, measures really take place. But I wouldn't say it's a disqualifier. It, it really depends on the level of your clearance and what country that spouse may be a, a, a citizen of. Um, so I think this is kind of for all of you. Can somebody or all of you maybe just give like a good rundown on how the private sector component of all this works? Because I know there's a lot of huge companies like ACOM and L3 and SAIC that are constantly trying to recruit, especially less common languages. But it seems like a lot of these companies are like preemptively trying to put together a huge base of people before they actually get a contract. But on the contrary, I've also heard a lot of stuff from people on the inside that like salary, compensation, insurance, upward mobility is way more rewarding than working for a federal agency. So I don't know, maybe are these people just directly recruiting for you? And if so, what's like, what am I losing out on as a potential employee or, you know, cause a lot of times they'll put postings out for languages that just don't exist on some of your websites. So I don't know if anyone could just give any insight into that. I'll start and then I'll hand it down very quickly. Um, we rely on contract linguists. As you heard earlier, we don't have a language capability in every single language of the world, the 7,000 some languages that are out there. Um, so we do rely on contract linguists. We hire them within the United States. We hire them overseas. And they do numerous operations for the government. Um, as far, and I'm going to pass this down. But as far as why the government versus the private sector, I would say career opportunity. And number one, I would say service to the country firsthand. Uh, that's, that's generally the reason, yes, you can earn a lot more money 
You might not be guaranteed a more secure job in the private sector. Um, but a lot of people don't do it for the money. They, when they do these jobs, they do it for the service of the country. Do you guys use contractors or no? Mm. No. Okay. So, uh, again, at the FBI, we rely a lot on contract linguists. We have 600 employee language analyst positions and 1,000 contract linguists uh, that work. So, obviously, most of our people are contractors. We would only go to a company if we absolutely have to because, to be perfectly honest, I'm going to pay an independent contract linguist $43 an hour, and that company that's sending me that same person with the same clearance, the same taste level, is charging me $150 an hour. And it's not like that linguist is making $150 an hour, so it's basically company overhead. So, um, yeah, definitely at a big company, you're definitely going to make more money. I guarantee you nobody on this panel is going to say, you're making the big bucks of the federal government. Nobody's going to say that. Let's be honest. You're doing it really for the service. You know, I would just add for DIA, um, it, you know, as Errol said, it depends on what you want. If you want a career or you just want to do, you know, interpretation translation work, if you're just happy doing interpretation translation, realizing that they'll pay the big bucks for things that, you know, we're going we're gonna to hire a contractor to do that if we don't think that there's a long-term requirement for that. If I know I need 70 people with a certain language skill, why am I going to go out and, you know, uh, get contracts? I'm going to get that's a long-term requirement. I'd rather have uh, government workers doing that. So it may be paying a lot of money for a short. Some of these, you know, do you want to go to Afghanistan? You want to deploy? I mean, they're paying big money for people that are willing to go out into the field and do that type of field work. And that's, you know, ephemeral. It's temporary. You figure out where that fits into your career path. So that's, that's kind of the pros and the cons of it. If you work in the federal government, you have an opportunity to start one place and then do something else, and you can grow in your career that way. And as they uh, alluded to, once you get your nose under the tent, once you're in the organization, you see a tons of opportunities that you don't see from the outside. So I guess that, that's three observations on that. One comment. Sorry, I know I'm, I'm the thing between you and the pizza, and I really apologize. Um, one thing, I think we covered uh, our mission in the language world very, very thoroughly here tonight. There's one area I'd just like to give you an awareness of. Uh, Pete mentioned, you know, we deal with the bad guys. The bad guys don't necessarily speak English all the time. In fact, rarely the time. So uh, we talked about, um, from the NSA perspective, kind of the technical proficiency that's needed, whether it's a counterproliferation type mission, understanding the, those technical type parts of the language. But there's another piece I would like you to take away and consider, and this, this is why we do seek native and heritage speakers significantly, and that's slang. Bad guys speak slang. We listen to it, we hear it to negotiate it, that's what we deal with. It's a whole other language. Uh, take it from an English perspective. Somebody learning English and trying to pick up slang. Everybody's seen a mafia movie, right? Hey, take care of this guy. Well, what does that mean for somebody? Well, somebody who is learning English from another language understand what that means. Oh, he's going to take care of me really nicely. Well, <laughs> not, not, not necessarily the case. The same applies in our field when, we're, when our guys are in the field. So please take that for consideration, too, as you pursue your language and your career. Thank you very much, everyone.